Hello, this is Nathan Beverly with Call for Salt. Um, I I'm actually stopped at a, at a Starbucks on the way to actually have I was uh, on the way to like stop at a coffee shop and work on my book um, that I work on as a hobby sort of I don't know if it's ever gonna get published but um, I'm on sort of a vacation between Christmas and New Year's and have a little bit of free time and I wanted before I did that I, I just had this on my heart had this on my mind this topic and I really wanted to get this out and just share it put it on my channel and just just lay it out there for anyone that might be able to be helped by it um, the issue of God of of Calvinism has been on my heart a lot lately um, many of you know where I stand on that issue and I just want to say right up, right up front if you're a Calvinist um, I consider you a brother and sister in Christ and I hope this speech this talk can you can understand that I see this as a secondary issue I do not see this I'm not calling you a heretic um, I love you and I hope that this can challenge you and maybe encourage you to look more into the Word of God and maybe maybe think maybe consider some things that you haven't before but um, maybe maybe you're not a Calvinist or you maybe you're not sure and you haven't considered and, and you're still open you're still studying and um, the claims of Calvinism has been have been a real challenge to you which they have been to me in the past um, I've had I've had some I've done some videos on them in the past way back in the past and um, in a lot more in-depth and I, this the point of my the point is just to get out this thing that has just been on my heart and I just can't seem to, to rest until I do it is to just kind of lay out what I believe is the most compelling argument against Calvinism um, I think the most compelling argument when it boils right down to it uh, against Calvinism is that it really um, it denies the love of God it denies uh, the love of God that we see in Scripture um, now again I don't want to say that Calvinism believes that but I don't believe Calvinists believe that it obviously denies the love of God they believe that God is love just like we do and uh, they there is a, a certain amount of love for the elect in their in their paradigm um, and, and that I mean, a great amount of love for the elect that God would you know send his son for the elect and die for the elect but there are so many contradictions and holes in their beliefs once you get past the surface level um, you realize that it, it just falls like a like a house of cards and and, and you really can't um, you really can't uphold the the love of God as any anything that makes any sense at all um, and so that is what is really I think is can be um, it can be it can be damaging to a person's faith if they they think about the, the negative sides and I a, a negative side of Calvinism and I and I I don't want to think I don't want to say either that Calvinists are uh, I'll, I'll just freely say right now I, I think there's a lot of Calvinists that obviously can be grow in their walk with the Lord and not be affected in a negative way because they don't think deeply about the negative side of their of their doctrines um, they they don't they focus on the positive side how much God loves them they feel humbled they worship God out of reverence which are all good outcomes uh, but it doesn't mean that they're the full weight of their doctrine the full um, ramifications of their doctrine are helpful or 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 even good or or honor God um, because just because they don't think about that I think there's a lot of cognitive dissonance there's a lot of contradictions that they accept and they just they just don't go there um, I, I, I don't know I mean every Calvinist would have to have probably come at it a different probably comes at it from a different perspective but I think a lot of the good ones when I say good ones a lot of the ones that love which clearly love God and love their love love the lost those are the ones that I think are really just just tr focusing on the good parts and and they they love people and they want them to be saved just like um, just like um, we would just like I would um, and someone that is not a Calvinist now um, what what is it about about the love of God that they get wrong well the love of God is just a basic definition would be seeking the, the benefit of of others or seeking the benefit of um, not just seeking the benefit but according to the biblical definition is this self-sacrificial sacrificing oneself for the benefit of others um, clearly I mean it's just like first um, Corinthians 13 it gives us a whole list of what love looks like of what God says love is and I call it the love test um, there's things like love is patient, love is kind, love seeks not its own. Those three things right there are huge for us to understand um, 
where Calvinism is coming from um, and where what I what I believe they get wrong. Now, what what why why am I saying that Calvinism gets it wrong? Well, the main one of the main things about Calvinism, the the you and the tulip. The you means unconditional election, and that literally means that God, before the world, the foundation of the world began, He chose a certain remnant of people, a certain group of people, an elect group, to be saved. Um, that He would send His Son for and die for, and that He love He set His love upon them, and that everybody else in the world was left out of that. God only wanted a certain group of people to be saved, and he he left everybody else because he chose this certain group of people. Um, it doesn't they don't give a reason for it. They say it was according to the counsel of his will that he did that. Um, and there's you know it's not it's not because of anything that that group of people earned or or any faith that he foresaw that they would have uh, of a free will faith when he when gave them the gospel. It's nothing according, has nothing to do with his knowledge of what would happen. This is simply what God decided. He determined it, predetermined it before the world began. Um, and everybody else that was created was created in, just like everybody was created with a sinful, totally simple nature. And they, they, they hate God. They turn from God at every chance. And they don't, without God, choosing them before the world began and without God Christ dying for them and irresistibly causing them to believe and giving them a faith to believe everybody is hopeless and so everybody else in the world all the quote unquote non-elect all the what you know if you read Calvinists a little more you, you hear them called the reprobate all of those reprobate are hopeless they're on an inexplicable or I'm sorry they're on a, they're an in, uh, unrevocable tract for an eternity in the lake of fire. They're created just to glorify God at the end, at their end, to glorify God, the, God's justice um, by their judgment and their his wrath being poured on them in the lake of fire. Um, and I just don't see, I don't think the average person when they hear about Calvinism, when they hear that, when they understand that that's what Calvinism is teaching, that I don't think the average person sees that as love. Now, are we, is the average person the standard or the measuring point? Absolutely not. If the Bible taught that that's what love was, then we would have to, we would have to agree with it. But my, what I'm saying is the Bible does not say that. It clearly does not say that. The Bible says that love is patient. Love is kind. Love seeks not its own. How is God being patient with a, with a non-elect if he's got a predetermined choice for them to be saved from all eternity past? And that, that was his, it was unchangeable decree that they would go there they had no hope of, of seeing the light of believing the truth of repenting because he would never reach out to them in any any way any meaningful way for them to be saved um where they would have no hope of salvation they're on their way for eternity in hell they have a few short, short years here on this earth and then they did they die and they go to hell forever how is that patient how is god being patient if if he doesn't even want to really want them to be saved in the first place, what is he being patient for? Second, how is that even kind? I mean, that's even more, that's even a bigger argument. How is that kind? How is that seeking the benefit of them? How, how can you say that you love those people if you give them a few years of sunshine and rain and on this earth and maybe some, some good times and good experiences for an eternity in a torturous lake of fire? Um, I hate to, List it in such harsh terms, but really, that's what the Bible is, describes as as the punishment, the final punishment. It's 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 forever separated from God in a lake of fire. Um, how is that kind? Um, how is it uh, self not seeks? How is it not seeking its own? If if what Calvinism says is true, that God does all this for to glorify His judgment upon. And to glorify his justice and his character, his just character, they, they deserve they deserve that, so they're going to hell. How does that not seek God's own and not deny his love as what well, in that way? Um, it does. It, I don't see how it does. I mean, that's seeking God's own at the expense of His creation. Um, but in in reality, self seeking. I mean, I mean, self sacrifice, loving someone for the good of someone else. For their benefit and and sacrificing oneself for for their benefit, it would be what Christ did on the cross, and He did that for everyone. The Bible says that He and in uh, Hebrews two nine it says He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. 
not just the whole world. It doesn't just say like in John three sixteen, for God's the love of the world. The Calvinists like split hairs and try to say that 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 world means all the different types of people or all the nations and tribes in the world. Um, but no, Hebrews two nine gets even more clear and it says, for every man he she should taste death for every man. Uh, Second Peter talks about um, the false teachers who are it says they are going to hell basically. You know, I'm just paraphrasing that, but it says there it's reserved for them. And it says they deny the Lord who bought them. He died even for the false teachers. So if we look at John three sixteen, it says, "For God so loved the world." So if we take it to mean, like Hebrews two nine says, every person, um, if God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that that phrase that He gave is saying in such a way that He loved the world in such a way that He gave His only begotten Son. He it, he didn't just love the world by doing kind things for them, individual things in their lives and giving them breath and sunshine and rain. He did it. He did it. He showed that love by dying for them. And the whole reason why he dies for them is to provide salvation for them. Um, and that is, that's love to God. God, I mean, God is self-sacrificial. Um, now, Calvinists try to get away, get away get around these kind of you know they, they they do believe that god loves everyone most of them i should say most of them do i have heard one or two calvinists in my life say that god does not love calvin i, I can think of one in particular that says that god does not love everybody um and they're just very honest with they're very consistent with with tulip that god does not love everybody and that he did not you know he is not trying to save them he does not desire them to be saved the whole nine yards um, but most Calvinists will try to say that God loves everybody, um, and they will. They do believe that. Um, how, do, how do they say that? Well, I think the number one way that they try to get around that is through mystery. Uh, they appeal to mystery. And the second way um, is they try to appeal to this common grace sort of sort of understanding of love. And I want to I talk about common grace thing first. Common grace is uh, really taken from, uh, I think it's Matthew 5 with the Sermon on the Mount, where it says, when God's, Jesus is saying to love your enemies. He said, even your your heavenly father loves his enemies. He, he gives sunshine and rain and all of these blessings on this world. Um, that passage was not supposed to be a treatise on God's eternal love, salvific love for all mankind. He's talking about love in time. He's trying to teach his followers to love, love like he does. Um, so he's not necessarily going, he hadn't even gone to the cross yet. So he's not pointing to that as the example but he's giving a specific examples but calvinism will try to say that well that's 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 how he loves the non-elect that he loves them but he loves them in a different way he doesn't love them obviously as much as those those who are elect he loves them in a common grace sort of way in other words he showers upon them certain graces by giving them life breath um health um, sunshine rain children family you know, all these different things that we all enjoy in this world. And those are blessings from God that we don't deserve. And I would totally agree with that. We we do believe in a sort of common grace that God gives to everyone. But the question is, is that common grace grace at all? If God creates them, remember, these are people that are created in his image. They're valuable just in the fact that they're created in his image. They're valuable to God. Every human being is valuable to God. Calvinists will uh, acknowledge this. You know, that's why he instituted the death penalty, because it says he's, God has created, I mean, man is created in the image of God. There's value to every single person, even those that, and he knows that will not get saved in the end. There's value to their soul. There's value to who they are in the sense that they're, they're a creation of God and they, rep, they um, in some way represent him and uh, they are in, the, in his image. So God created all of, all of these people in his image and he gives them a, just a few years, 70, 80 years of sunshine and rain and some good experiences, some also very painful experiences because of the sin, their sin they have to go through. But in the end, they die and they go to hell for all of it. They go to a lake of fire for all of eternity. Um, and they they justly, you know, pay for their sins in, in all for all of eternity. Now, I think there's an argument can be made that that is, they are receiving the just penalty of their sins, but is that love? Is that loving? you know, take, take justice out of it for a second. Is that, is that loving to create people in your image? Is that kind? Is that self, self-sacrificial? Is that patient to create people in your image? 
that are going to hell for all of eternity to just give them a few years. To me, it seems more like a cruel joke and I think the average person would see it that way. It's not a fair trade. <laughs> it's not a fair trade, not even close. Eternity compared to a, f a few years of good things. Eternity of torture compared to a few, few years of good things. That doesn't, that just doesn't, that doesn't follow. It, it that argument, it, when people give that argument to me, I think it's the worst. I, I mean, with all due respect, Calvinist, I think it's the worst argument ever. That is not in any normal person's understanding of love at all. It is it is a twisting of love. It is something that it, that I just we just can't accept as, you know, uh, you know that's that doesn't doesn't pass the First Corinthians thirteen test. It's not kind. It's not kind. Um, Second thing is the appeal to mystery. I think a lot of Calvinists just just go here and they go here to any really any contradiction that they you have in, that they are presented with in their system um, or an apparent contradiction in their system. They they would say, well, that's a paradox. We don't fully understand that. It seems like a contradiction, but it's not because it's a mystery and you know it's, God's ways are higher than our ways and we can never understand certain things. And so we'll just leave that with God and, and it all works out. It's all going to work out somehow, and it'll maybe there's an explanation for it that God will give us. Maybe He won't, but that's God's ways, and we can't pretend to understand. So, I have a pro. I do have a problem with that. The reason why is because there's a difference between a mystery and a contradiction. A mystery is something that you don't understand because you don't have all the information. Um, like maybe the Trinity. That's not something that that necessarily that is like wow, like. That just there's two things that are just completely at odds. No, it's like there's there's more you know there's there's more there's there's different ways that we could try to explain it that would kind of make sense, but not enough information is given so that we can fully do that. Now, a contradiction are two opposing things that cannot be that, that all the information is given. It can be very simple, but two opposing uh, statements that cannot be true at the same time. They're just completely opposite. For example, a the statement A equals not A. A A cannot equal not A. A cannot equal B. They're two very different things. Um, another kind of a example would be it's raining and not raining at the same place at the same time. It's both raining and not raining at the same place. I mean, that's a logical impossibility. Those things cannot be true. They're a contradiction. And I would posit, I would posit with all of my heart that God, when he says what love is, he makes it very clear what love is. It's not a mystery. So when he says love is patient, love is kind, love seeks not his own, we can take that to the bank. We can understand that that's what love is to, to God. So if we see God acting in a way that is um, completely not that way, that is, there's no way you could, you could describe it that way, then then that's a contradiction. It's not a mystery. And, and Calvinists would try to say, well, you know, the fact that God um, creates people with no hope of salvation, you know, and they're going to hell for all of eternity, and he doesn't try to save them, doesn't do anything for them to save them, and give, doesn't provide a uh, savior uh, for them, um, that, that the fact that, you know, God loves them and somehow that he does that, that's, a, that's just a, that will appeal to mystery on that. It's apparent. It's an apparent contradiction, but it's not a true contradiction. That's just completely. It's just that doesn't hold any water at all. Um, the fact that they try to say, well, that is that is love. No, it's not love. We know God reveals what love is. Um, and so, what 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 kind of problems do we run into if we we start appealing to mystery all the time, or especially on these big clear things about God's nature? Well then, then, then what do we believe? What can we hold on to as as true? You know, we, those of us that are not Calvinists, can take some of the things that we don't like about Calvinists, um, that we that we think that we, you know, God's judgment and wrath that we're gonna, we don't prefer to see that and say, oh well, that that doesn't mean God's judgment actually means he he's gonna show kindness to them. He's gonna God's judgment in, in eternity, the lake of fire, that really means something different. That's, he's actually going to give them a palace and riches and luxuries, and that's what it means. Um, he will, they'll be separated from God. There's still some you know, sense of truth to that, but, but it's, it's a completely different view. We're, we're going to say that that's what that means, and, and we're just going to appeal to mystery. Um, I mean, I know the Bible doesn't say that, right? The Bible doesn't say that, so we can't do that. But I'm just saying, like, if you, if you take 
something that God clearly says and you and you turn it around to appeal to mystery, then you can do that with anything. Um, you can do you can do that with anything. How do we know what judgment? How do we know what um, faithfulness is? How do we know what any of anything God says are true? You know, we start we start worshiping God, but we don't even understand what His character is, and we start you know saying that God's ways are higher than our ways, and that's what we always appeal to. When we start worshiping God, we don't even know what it means anymore. I mean, how does how does that help our relationship with God if we don't know what He means by goodness, righteousness, truth? Um, justice, all of these things, if we, they could be a mystery that are beyond us. But God says, he says what love is. That's my whole point. God says what love is. He, he reveals, that's why he gives us his word, to know him, to understand him. Uh, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 um, is a wonderful passage because it says, um, this is what he says, this is what God says. He says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But he that glories, let him glory in this. Now, this, what is it that we should glory in? That he understands and knows me, the God who, who understands and knows me, who who exercises loving kindness, righteousness, uh, I'm sorry, loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. How in the world are we supposed to understand and know God if we don't understand his character? And he lists his character right there. He says, Look, don't don't try don't glory in yourself. Don't glory in all these things that lift yourself up. Glory in me that you understand me, that you know me, and that you understand these character traits that this is who I am. How do we understand him? How do we know him if we don't understand the character trait attributes that he gives us right there? If we don't know what love is, if we don't know what right uh, just judgment is, if we don't know what righteousness is, as he says there in Jeremiah 9, we can't know God. We can't understand anything. How do we worship him? How do we tell other people about him with with author with an authoritativeness? How do we understand? How do we trust in him as our God? It all just goes up to mush. It's all just a big, you know, it's all it's all murky at that point. So the mystery card just it doesn't work. If you go down that path too much, it's it, it's just not it, it hurts your relationship with God. Um and so I, I would just say, why don't we just take God at his word? When he says what love is, we say, okay, God, we know what love is. We know it's clearly spelled out what love is. It's clearly spelled out who you are and that you are unchangeable, that your character doesn't change. So when we see these more obscure passages about the, the elect and <clears throat> God choosing the elect and all of this, it can't mean, as, as John Wesley said at one point, whatever... Uh, predestination means it can't mean that in other words what Calvinism says it means it can't mean that because these clear clear passages cannot be denied that he tasted death for every man that God is willing that none should perish but all should come to repentance that he will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth um, that he died for you know he was a propitiation propitiation for all men for, I mean, for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I mean, you have clear passages that just <laughs> leave no no doubt of what who God loves and and what He did for the world. So, love is love is what the Bible. Oh, sorry, I just lost my phone. Fell down. But love is what the Bible exactly what the Bible reveals it to be, and it's it's not hard. It's not you know it's deep, it's broad, but it's not uh, it's not outside of our understanding God reveals what it means it's self-sacrificing for the good of others and if you love somebody you, you do that if you love someone you're patient you're kind you're not self-seeking you, you care about them and you care about their benefit that's all it is thanks for listening I hope this can encourage you if you needed to hear that if you're if you don't if you didn't need to hear that and maybe you're a Calvinist and you're just doing great with your walk with God. I don't mean that sarcastically at all. You know, just keep going. Uh, maybe maybe God's using the doctrines of grace, his sovereignty to help you focus on him in, in a reverent sort of way. And I respect that. So um, keep going. Um, but hopefully this can help. And and I just want to thank the Lord for what he has done in my life and uh, saving me as a, a deserving sinner. I mean, a, a sinner that deserves judgment but also that he he's a God of love and that he created me knowing that 
he would provide a salvation for me, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Praise the Lord. Amen. Have a great day. Bye.